to our uh, continuous journey you think will never end. And the truth of the matter is, when you begin studying theology, you, it never ends. Yeah, it's a, it, it becomes a lifelong endeavor for you. And, and my hope is that this uh, class will, um, which is trying to give an overview, will whet your appetite and that you'll um, be led to uh, pursue further um, your own personal uh, study of, of theology. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit and that aspect of theology is called, oh I don't have something to write with, pneumatology. So um, it would be P N E U M A T O L O G Y, is that right? Tology? Tology? Pneumatology. P N E U M A, pneumatology, right? T O L O G Y. You're asking us. Is that right? <laughs> yes. I got that pneumatology. Um, and of course, that, that is a Greek word, and the Greek word it uh, has two parts. Um, um, the the first part, pneuma, uh, is the word, Greek word for spirit, and um, it's where we get the um, the um, the word pneumonia um, comes f uh, directly from the Greek word. And pneumonia is uh, an airborne disease. And it affects your ability to breathe. Um, like Hebrew, pneuma can be used to uh, refer to breath. In Hebrew, it's ruach, which um, uh, is R-U-A-H, ruach. Some people will put a CH at the end, which makes it a harder ending. Oh, good. Thank you. So, uh, pneumatology. Is that how I spelled it for you? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I think this is right. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is the word for spirit. So, it is the study, and lo logi is from the word logos, uh, and so we could say the study of the Spirit. And in particular, um, it's the study of the Spirit in the life of the church. So, in a sense, we are still in the, uh, this is a subheading of ecclesiology. Also, um, we'll be talking about um, what are called the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, which in Greek is charismata. 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 And I think that's already there. You see it there on, your, on the title of your page. Um, so, um, you've heard the word charismatic when you are referring to someone. Uh, John F. Kennedy was very charismatic. Ronald Reagan was very charismatic. Um, and what we mean by that is that they were um, extraordinarily gifted. So people are drawn to them because of their giftedness. Uh, uh, so uh, we think of, we use the word in that sense, but it still means the same, someone who, who is gifted. But in the New Testament, it's referring um, to the gifts that the Holy Spirit imparts to individual members of the community but it's really a gift to the whole community. So if you have one of the charismata, then um, that is a gift not, that's not given for just your own benefit, although it, it, it does have a benefit for you. But it, more than that, it's for the benefit of others in the community. And um, in the New Testament writings, um, we see that in the first generation of the church, that this was a big part of the church life in the first generation. 
And some of the gifts um, would appear to be something akin to natural talents that one would have. Um, but other gifts are clearly of a supernatural nature. But the fact of the matter is they are all supernatural in that the source of those gifts are to be found, uh, are, is to be found in the person of the Holy Spirit. So in order to talk about the gifts and the ministries within the church, we need to talk first about the Holy Spirit and our relationship to the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, last Sunday in my homily, I went on way too long because I was trying to cram it all into one homily and I realized that was kind of, that was tough. So, so uh, this Sunday, I'm gonna be speaking about the Blessed Trinity in my homily, but it's gonna be much shorter because I, I, I recognize I don't have to tell you everything in one homily. <laughs> so, but now in this class, uh, oh, oh, I'm glad you appreciated it. Oh, you're, you're, you're such a great uh, fan. Okay, um, in, now let's go to Roman numeral one. In the development of early Christian theology, the Holy Spirit has come to be understood as being divine. Divine. So, just as the Father is God, we get that, um, and just as the Son is God or is divine, well, we think we got that. <laughs> So is the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is the most mysterious. We can kind of have an idea in our minds about the Father, um, although most of our ideas fall far short of the reality. And we have ideas uh, about the Son, but the Holy Spirit has always been one that is more difficult to try to even find an analogy or to imagine. One of the things to be avoided when speaking of the Holy Spirit is to rob the Holy Spirit of the qualities of person. Um, the Holy Spirit can be experienced as energy, but the Holy Spirit is not lifeless energy or, um, uh, you know, it, 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 the Holy Spirit is not just like nuclear energy or electricity. Don't, don't think of the Holy Spirit in that way. The Holy Spirit is one of the persons of the divine trinity. Co-equal, we say, as you'll remember from our lesson on Trinity, with the Father and the Son. So th therefore, if the Holy Spirit's personal, then we can have a relationship, a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is not something <laughs> that we can harness and use for our own ends, like hydro power or nuclear power, but rather the Holy Spirit um, is a sovereign person that we enter into relationship with. And that's really important distinction to make. There are um, other groups that come out of the Christian movement that deny the personality of the Holy Spirit. One of them is a group that you're familiar with because they sometimes knock on your door, Jehovah Witnesses. They take the view that the Holy Spirit is impersonal and it's the power of God, the energy of God. Um, they take that by necessity because they reject the idea of the Blessed Trinity. So even for them, even Jesus is not divine. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's the reason they're that way. But also in, among Christian groups that have been heavily influenced by Gnosticism, which is... Um, um, a, a, gr a group of ideas that were rejected by the church in the early centuries and have some of them have reemerged in what we call New Age uh, today. And this is not a blanket condemnation of New Age because I think New Age has a lot to say to us. But I, uh, some New Age ideas reduce the Holy Spirit to, uh, to being less than personal. So it's always important for us to bear in mind that the Holy Spirit is a person and the, the way we approach the Spirit or can experience the, pers uh, the Spirit is in terms of having a relationship with the Spirit. Does that make sense? So that's a really important point. Um, so in the Trinitarian formulas, the Holy Spirit was recognized as being one of the three persons of the Holy Trinity. The words persons, yes. It's a little more difficult because there isn't a person involved. There's God the Father and God the Son. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is 
Yeah, it, it's very. It, that's the difficulty because I can imagine because of the um, God the Father. We use the image because mm. Father is an analogy. Well, when you think of Father, you're already thinking in terms of a person. Um, when you think of the historical person of Jesus, well, he's a person. You can read about his adventures, and you've seen pictures of him. <laughs> You will not find a picture of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's no real analogy. And yeah, well, when I was a child, I I would try to when I would when they would we used to say Holy Ghost. And so I I would kind of think that the Holy Spirit was a little like Casper. You know, was a person that was if I could see him would be white, like a silhouette, white silhouette or something. Okay, A, like the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit shares the same divine substance. The word is substance, it's a Latin word. Or we can use the word essence. Substance or essence um, could also be more easily translated in a more understandable way as being, B-E-I-N-G. So substance, essence, or being. The, it is the nature of a thing. Although we're using words from our experience in the world, when you apply them to the divine, we have to be very careful. But what we're saying is, is that just as the Father is divine in His being, and the Son is divine, so the Holy Spirit is fully divine. The Holy Spirit is co-equal and co-eternal to the Father and the Son in the divine life. <clears throat> the uniqueness, uh, oh, like the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit is a distinct person who relates to the Father and the Son in the Trinitarian community of the divine life. God is personal and relational. That's what God is in God's essence. Um, so even though we will say that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. We're not talking about three gods, it's one God. However, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit's not the Father. So they are distinct persons. This is the nature of the revelation that's been given to us. And what this ultimately says is that, that the divine life, and this is very basic to the Christian understanding of God, the divine life is personal and relational not an abstraction. The God of the f Greek philosophers was an abstraction and very impersonal and far removed. You wouldn't have a personal relationship with the God of the philosophers. Okay? Um, the uniqueness of the Spirit, as opposed to the Father and the Son, is seen in the Spirit's relationship with the created world. How does the Spirit relate with the, created wo the creative world? The created world. The divine life is the original and primal being. The universe, the created world, is the derived being that flows, it should be that, not the, that flows from the creative energies of the divine life. The creative energies. Energia, or the work, or the activity of the divine. Roman numeral two, the Holy Spirit as creator. The Holy Spirit is a co-creator, co-creator along with the Father and the Son in the creation of the universe. So when it says God created the heavens and the earth, we're talking about the divine life creating the heavens and the earth. The Holy Spirit was involved. The Son, who at this time was known as the eternal word, and the Spirit also played a role in the creation of the universe. Yes? Okay, um, the word energies, Oh, yeah, very the, close. the word energies still gets me a little trapped because I find it trapping. <laughs> you find How, it what? Trapping. It, mm -hmm. Because when we hear the word energy, we hear solar energy. We hear, yeah. you know, which is very earthly, yeah. you know. So this when we, worldly, yeah. Yeah, worldly. So I think it's really difficult to use that word. And, but I understand that it's, it, you know, when you really un have an experience of the Holy Spirit, then energy is fine. But if yeah. you don't have that. So then this other word comes to me, movement. It's like a movement, like this. Uh, uh. 
Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm grappling with it. I'm trying to, you know, because yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not struggling for myself personally, but struggling for others. How would we convey this information, you know, because uh, <clears throat> it's just fascinating. It's the most exciting thing, I think, yeah. of anything that we've learned, you know, right now in the class because, you know, the Holy Spirit, I mean, what a beautiful gift we've been given because, I mean, yeah. just left to our own devices, it would have been just a mess. Right. After Jesus passes, the most brilliant gift that we could have received. It's like compassion and love and beyond words even mm -hmm. because it's just amazing how the Holy Spirit works. It's just, uh, it blows my mind. Yeah. But, but still, when we use the word energy, it's limiting. So, yeah. And the way we, in the context of our culture, when we think of energy, we're thinking of fossil fuel energy right, or right. electricity so or how nuclear can we, energy. So um, that's not I like quite, the word work. Yeah. That, and, work. And, right. And in fact, the word uh, energia, which is the Greek word Maybe that's that we get well, our word and we get our energy, we get our word energy from that. But when the Greeks were thinking of uh, energia, they were not thinking of fossil fuels. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or nuclear energy or gasoline or electricity. Mm -hmm. the, uh, those things were unknown to them. They always use it in terms of activity. Yeah, okay. So the, uh, the energies of God is the activity of God in relation to the created world in the universe. And to give you kind of a, a way of thinking about that, um, no one has ever seen God at any time. So, in the universe, we can never see God. God is not observable. However, we do see the activity of God, the effects like of God. I'm so excited. Yeah, Okay, because the Go other day, I was, I'm sorry, I was sitting in my dining room, and from my dining room, I can see the trees outside blowing. Uh -huh. We cannot see the wind. But we can see what the wind does. The effects of the yes. wind. Yes. And so I was like, that's the Holy Spirit. That's how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. We cannot yeah. see the Holy Spirit, but we can, we, can, we can see it moving in our friends. You know, we have conversations. That's right. We can see it in movies that are created. There's like, you know, you can see a whole movie, but there's one line in the movie where you go, that's it. That's, yeah. that's the Holy Spirit. I mean, you right. know, I'm, I'm a little bit nuts about it, but, you know, it's, <laughs> but I get it. So, you yeah. know, but that was a perfect example i go oh my gosh i cannot see the wind but i can see what it's doing to the mm -hmm. trees and i've had that experience before but it was like it got me right at that moment you know like whoa yeah. so that's the holy spirit yeah that's exciting yeah and so the holy spirit's not just an abstraction it is a reality that we can experience so um we can never feel the holy spirit directly but we can but we can have experiences with the holy spirit in which we feel the effects of the holy spirit and, uh, and that can happen in many different ways, depending on persons. You can, sometimes you can, feel it in, uh, you can feel the presence and the activity of the Spirit in your body. You can, you can have a bodily experience. And over the years, I've talked with enough people, and I've had my own experience that I could point to that. So um, it, uh, the, the, the work of the Spirit is very real. So when we talk about the energies of God, we're talking about the activity of God in relationship to the world. And the Holy Spirit plays a definite role in that. Okay, <clears throat> now the Holy Spirit is a co-creator. That's A, right? Along with the Father and the Son in the creation of the universe. Number one, the Father by divine decree called the universe into being. So it was the Father who willed. In other words, it was the Father's idea <laughs> to create the universe, okay? Okay, and more specifically, the will of the Father. So the universe came into being by the divine will. It's not a random phenomenon. It is the result of intentionality. That intentionality originates in the Father. That's the Father's role. Number two, the Son, or the Word, the eternal self-expression of the divine life is the means or agency by which the divine will was exercised and the universe was given form and through which the universe continues to subsist. Everything is held together by the Logos, by the Word, by the Son. In fact, the universe is so dependent upon, uh, upon the Son for its existence without, without the uh, activity of the word, the universe could not sustain itself. It would just cease to exist. 
So moment by moment, the fact that we exist moment by moment is through the sustaining work of Christ or the Logos in his divine nature. Um, so, uh, yes, you have a question, Michael? Do we get that from that whole notion? Do we get that from the Gospel of John? Yeah, uh, that and also from another writer um, that is anonymous to us, the writer to the Hebrews, this notion. Um, but it's really said very clearly, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, the same was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, the Word, and nothing that exists could exist apart from Him. So that's where you get the idea. That John, that's what John is striving to us. Okay, um, I was wondering, um, Tammy, would you like to go to my office and I have an icon? Uh, it's sitting there. You'll see it. I think it's on my round table there or maybe leaning against a bookcase. If you could get it and bring it down, it's, it's a good size icon. I want to show it to you. You're getting a preview of something very exciting. Okay. So the word, the eternal self-expression, I think I've already read that. Are we in number three? Yes. The Holy Spirit is the divine power through which the divine will and I should say the divine expression, which is the word, is realized. So, some people want to uh, retranslate the creed. You know how the creed begins? What's the first line of the creed? I believe. Right. Some people um, feel that, um, yes. Isn't this, this is the Trinity. Isn't that beautiful? And it's going to be uh, blessed uh, this Sunday because it's Holy Trinity Sunday. Isn't this great? It's a gift uh, given to us by Brian and Jerry Ann Massetta. Cool. Isn't that beautiful? That beautiful. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm just so happy with it. And um, this is my favorite depiction of the Trinity, which, which you cannot depict, but it's using a biblical story of the three visitors with, to Abraham. And so they're depicted as three angels here. Mm -hmm. The importance is that it's three persons, and they're gathered around a table, and they are in relationship with one another. They, they, they are leaning in towards one another, and they're gesturing to each other as if they're in conversation. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the powerful thing about it. It's a beautiful icon. Isn't it beautiful? It's based on Rublev's icon. And this, is, this represents the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This angel represents the Father. This angel represents the Son. And this, re uh, uh, this, represents, this angel represents the Spirit. So um, the Father is gesturing to this bowl here, which has the head of an ox in it that's been severed. This represents sacrifice. The Eucharistic cup, the sacrifice. Jesus is right by the sacrifice. And um, the Father's gesturing to the sacrifice. So is the Son. The Son, uh, the Father is wearing more of a golden outfit. <laughs> you know, the glory of God the Father. Jesus is wearing the red, which the crimson, which represents his, he's a martyr, his death. Holy Spirit is wearing green, which suggests life. The Lord and giver of life. Then you'll see three objects here uh, behind the angels. I'll come over here so you can look at it. Okay. Above the Father is a house. Above the Father is the house. In my Father's house. Got it? Um, above the Son is the tree. Remember, he was crucified upon a tree. Another word for the cross is he was nailed to a tree. Um, and then uh, you have the mountain uh, summit behind the Holy Spirit. Remember the Shekinah glory, the mountaintop experience where the cloud appears. That's always the Holy Spirit. See, iconography is just beautifully uh, symbolic for us. And uh, so I just want you to see the house, the tree, and the mountain. This is, where is 
the Father. This is the Father. Okay. This is the Son, and notice that each one is towards one another. Right. And then the Holy Spirit. Very deliberate and intentional what he was conveying. So icons, you don't paint an icon, you write an icon, because it's sending you a message. So it's, um, uh, an icon is a theological document. You like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, B. The, um, in the beginning, the Spirit is present at creation. Oh, Tammy, while you were going up there, we did number three there, and the, it, the blank is power. Okay, in the beginning, the Spirit is present at creation. Now, go to page two, number one. Spirit. In Hebrew, it's ruach. Ruach can be translated in the following ways. Are you ready for this? Spirit. Secondly, mighty wind. Like hurricane force winds. C, gentle breeze. Or D, breath. And so the translator has to look at the context to know which of those four they would render ruach into. Number two, the Spirit swept over the formless primordial waters, whatever that is, chaos. The uninformed stuff or substance from which the universe emerges. This is the, from the language of that great creation poem in Genesis. So the Spirit is described as is sweeping over the formless primordial waters, the uninformed Formed. I, it said, I think I have uninformed there. It's unformed, oh. not uninformed. <laughs> or No, it's un uniformed. uniformed. Yeah, that's not right. You know, uh, the, the problem with my computer is it will self-correct, you know. And uh, uh, so anyway, uh, 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 it's unformed stuff or substance from which the universe emerges, matter. Number three, the spirit broods. B-R-O-O-D-S. Um, it's, it's, it's a Hebrew word um, that is also has many meanings. One is, um, it, it, it gives a sense of a, a, like a bird that hovers in midair. Have you ever seen that? Like a hawk hovering in midair looking down? That, that, that hovering action, that's kind of the image that you could use. Or another one is, um, the spirit is brooding over the primordial waters. Another image for that is a chicken uh, sitting on the nest of eggs, waiting for them to hatch. Do you see? So those are, that's how the word is used. Uh, so the, the spirit is given this kind of um, uh, image uh, 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 already of a bird. And so you'll notice that in, in iconography, oftentimes the Holy Spirit is portrayed as a, a dove, and it's used uh, uh, very commonly. So, number four, the spirit hovers over the chaos from which the order of the universe shall issue forth. This is all based upon that passage in Genesis, which is a poetic passage. So, the spirit gives birth to the universe, like the chicken brooding over her eggs, waiting for the universe to hatch. <laughs> you like that? Okay. Um, the Spirit, C, has a special role in the creation of humanity. Not only in the creation of the universe, but the Spirit plays uh, a special role in the creation of humanity. And this is from the second creation story in Genesis chapter 2. Humanity, um, the word for humanity in Hebrew is Adam. We usually make it a personal name, and that's okay, but it's also the name for humankind, Adam. So, this uh, humanity, Adam, is formed by the hand of God from the earth. Yes. Um, so, did the Hebrews understand that Adam and Eve story as strictly allegorical? Since the word Adam to them meant humankind, did they, did they get the fact? Do they do they understand it as folklore about two individuals and God, or do they understand it as a, as a metaphor, or a, I don't know if it's the right word, is it yeah. a metaphor allegory or what, but. Yeah, um, um, 
I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, but you know who would be the guy to ask? Father Frank. Father Frank. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so the thing, the thing, the, the, yeah. The, the thing is, it, it is mythic language. It's a, it's it's a mythological story, and in a sense that it's a simple story that's trying to convey a deeper reality or truth. So it, uh, and so when you think of it that term in those terms, you think of it as a story that is something like an analogy. We don't. We have no way of knowing what an ancient Hebrew would have thought of it. You know, maybe the more. You know, it's like your children. Someone who is highly educated and elderly and sophisticated will begin to think of can think more abstractly than a young child who would take it quite literally. What I find in the Christian experience, because I've been in the world of Christianity all my life, is that there are adults that still take it literally, and as a result, they miss the analogy which I think is more important than the literal story. Yes? So the, we know by certain things that we read in the Bible that the Spirit was definitely present in the very beginning. Yes. <clears throat> but we didn't really e experience the full um, capacity, I guess you could say, though that's a limited word, of the Holy Spirit until Pentecost Sunday when... Yeah. When... You know, it was full force given that that was the, the day, so to speak, yeah. or the moment. So that, that's very that's fascinating to me how even though, you know, the Spirit was from the beginning, but the role that the Spirit played was just so very something, you know, yeah. but bam, then one day it's like, well, there it is. There's no getting away from it now. <laughs> right, right. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, uh, as far as... Um, from, the, from our understanding as Christians, the Holy Spirit has always been present with us, sustaining the universe and even present in the within of our, you know, there's an entire universe inside of you. <laughs> you know, the mysterious, the mystery of the person you are. And the Spirit is with you. So the Spirit has always been with humanity. However, on Pentecost and the key word that you use, you know, you think very theologically, Adelia, which I, and because uh, your last comment was the same thing, but in this comment, the fullness of the Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit in a new way and in a new dimension and in a fuller way at Pentecost. So, uh, okay, um, now <clears throat> I completely forgot what I was. Oh. By the way, number two, remember the word Adam means humanity? Well, there's a related word, Adama. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. That means earth, soil, ground, clay, mud, dust, or dirt, or the color red. So, what is Adama? Adama is creature of mud, dust, dirt that's red in color. <laughs> So, so, in this mythological language of the second chapter, um, God is portrayed, and I would presume God the Father, God is portrayed as being like a craftsman working with clay, molding out of the clay humanity. This is obviously an analogy. And then, so, what it's saying is that God created humanity from the stuff of the earth, from the minerals and the matter and the gases and all the matter that is a part of the earth. God intentionally formed humanity from that. But that's, that, that's just the bodily, material part of us because humanity becomes into being when God breathes the breath, which is ruah, the spirit of life, into the Adam that he formed with his hands out of the earth. Humanity becomes a living soul, a living soul, and has the image of God. So we, at the same time, humanity is of the earth. Our origin is in the earth. The earth produced us, but it was God through the processes of creation that were going on in the earth. This is why in Catholic theology we have absolutely no problem with evolution. Evolution it, it may be giving us an account 
of the particular steps involved. In, but but what, what all this story is telling us is that humanity is of the earth. The earth produced us. So in a way, the earth is our mother. If it was over millions of years or billions of years of evolutionary processes, we don't have a problem with that at all. Not that it's not possible. God could have just done it instantly if God chose to do that. Um, now, the, um, but, but that's not the complete, that doesn't give us a full account of how it is that we exist and what we are. And so we are of the earth, but also at the same time, we are of the spirit. God breathed into us. So at one and the same time, we are earthly and heavenly simultaneously. There's a heavenly aspect to us and there's an earthly aspect to us. Okay? Are you having a good time so far? Yes. Um, <clears throat> humanity is formed of the earth and therefore earthly. Humanity comes into being through the inbreathing of the spirit, the divine life, and therefore is of direct divine origin. Direct divine origin. So, we are therefore heavenly. I just threw that in. You could write that there. Okay, five. Humanity is a complex being of body, the material part of ourselves, soul, which is the manifestation that occurs through the combination of spirit and body. So we have a soul. The soul is our conscious mind, the place of our uh, will, the place of our intellect, the place of our emotions, and so on. Um, so we are a body, soul, and we are a spirit. That's the deepest, it's what makes us a unique person. And what makes us in the image of God is that we are persons, spirits, like God is personal. So, and I get, uh, and number six, and you'll remember this from a previous lesson that seems so long ago now, you wonder that you're still in the same class. This has been going on a long time. In the fall, the fall I'm referring to is not the season. The fall is that moment in the story in which Adam and Eve uh, lose their immortality. Um, in the fall, humanity loses the divine life and becomes subject to the death. Remember that whole thing? Death is our big problem. That's what we need to be rescued from. Three, Roman numeral three, the Spirit's role in salvation. The Spirit's presence is active in Moses and the prophets. And this is where I want you to go. And let's see. Um... Charisma Ta scripture readings. Do you have that? Scripture readings. So, the Spirit's presence is active in Moses and the prophets. We're there. Are you there in the worksheet? Now, upon Moses and the 70 elders, I, I want you to look at this curious passage because it says something about how human beings can, uh, how human beings do experience the Spirit of God. So, um, Avelia, would you read that um, upon Moses and the seventy elders from Numbers? That's in the Torah, twenty-four to thirty. If you could read that passage for us. Okay, I'm trying to find it here. Okay. okay. It's in the back. Oh, here we go. Here we go. So scripture readings, and it's num. It's uh, uh, upon Moses and the seventy elders, and. Numbers chapter 11, verse 24 to 30. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. Gathering 70 elders of the people, he had them stand around the tent. The Lord then came down in the cloud and spoke to him. Taking some of the spirit that was on Moses, he bestowed it on the 70 elders. And as the spirit came to rest on them, they prophesied but did not continue. Now two men, one named Eldad and the other Medad, had remained in the camp, yet the Spirit came to rest on them also. They too had been on the list, but had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. 
So when a young man ran and reported to Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who from his youth had been Moses' aide, said, My lord Moses, stop them. But Moses answered him, Are you jealous for my sake? If only all the people of the Lord were prophets, if only the Lord would bestow his spirit on them. Then Moses retired to the camp along with the elders of Israel. So um, one, of the, one of the manifestations of the spirit uh, that we will see elsewhere, but here, is this phenomenon of prophesying. Now, that word may not mean too much for us because when we talk about prophecy in our culture, we're thinking about someone who can predict future events, right? That's primarily how we think of it. And that really wasn't, um, um, there might, that might be an aspect, but it's not the whole story. Um, prophecy is being in a, in a state in which you are overcome by the Spirit and then you sing or chant. And in the singing of chanting, there's a message that comes through, an oracle from the Lord. And the person's able to do that, not because the person's a good musician, but because the Holy Spirit is upon that person. So when it says that um, Medab and Eldad were prophesying in the camp, um, they weren't sitting there uh, giving fortune telling, you know, <laughs> predicting the future. They were just caught up in this kind of ecstatic singing and dancing. This is how the prophets would be that's how people would recognize a prophet, by this behavior, because it was unusual behavior, inspired behavior. Okay, now uh, we have the passage from Samuel upon the Nebi'im. And Nebi'im is the Hebrew word for prophets, so you can write prophets there. That's what Nebi'im means. So you can impress your friends by saying the Nebi'im. Nothing good. Yeah. Yeah. That. Okay. So, so... Um, uh, so would, okay, would Steve, would you read that passage for us? Sure. I had something to oh, say. Oh, you had something yeah. to say? Well, we've been studying the prophets in our Old Testament study, right? You know, we're, you know, we're doing Jeremiah. We're doing, you know, we've done all the, the prophets we read in Kings, you know, in our Bible study. And so in that sense, you know, like, for example, Jeremiah, you know, he... And the other prophets we've studied, what they're... they're, they're, they're keeping the people true you know they're holding them to the to the covenant and it seems that that has been their major work so in that sense it's a little bit different the prophecies prophesying but at the same time it's the same because they're just mm -hmm. doing it differently they're you know going on like you know at a liturgy for example in the temple you know it's carrying on you know yeah. saying this has to be done and that is it you know and that but it's fascinating to me how those particular prophets got written about, and there's, you know, like there was some other prophets that we hardly even heard about. The one that I was really going on the other day was Holdad, because she's a woman prophet, yeah. and she had a significant role in what came down the pike after that. It was like powerful, you know, but I, you know, and then seeing these guys prophesying in the camp, it seems a little bit more, it seems different. Yeah. So I'd like a little more talk on that. Yeah, um, there, there is a development among the Nebi'im over time. At first, they were people who traveled in bands together and were doing dancing and this kind of chanting and singing. That, that's prophecy. You'll see this in the next reading we get to. But also, um, as time goes on, the prophets, the later prophets, begin to write their oracles. And, and, and so they take on a role of actually being the conscience of the nation of Israel. But that's a, pro, uh, a result of a, a development or a evolution. So you're quite right in your observation there. So Steve, if you would read to us the next passage that we have. 1 Samuel 10, 5 through 13. Samuel said to Saul, you will come to Gibeth, Elohim, and as you enter that city, you will meet the band of prophets coming down from the high place. They will be preceded by lyrists, tambourines, flutes, and harps, and will be in a prophetic ecstasy. 
the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will join them in their prophetic ecstasy and will become a changed man. When these signs have come to pass, do whatever lies to him, because God is with you. Now go down ahead of me to Gilgal, for I shall come down to you to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice. Commune offerings. Wait seven days until I come to you. I shall then tell you what you must do. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed his heart. That very day, all this sign, all these signs came to pass. From there, they arrived at Gebeh, where a band of prophets met Saul, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, so that he joined them in their prophetic ecstasy. When all who had known him previously saw him in a prophetic state among the prophets, they said to one another, What has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And someone from that district responded, And who is their father? Thus the saying arose, Is Saul also among the prophets? When he came out of a prophetic ecstasy, he went home. So you see there is a parallel between the two descriptions that um, to receive the Holy Spirit is to receive the spirit of prophecy and it's a, it, 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 it is something that's very visible. And of course, if you saw a bunch of people dancing in an unusual way and singing and chanting and playing instruments, you would say, these are a bunch of holy rollers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Now um, we have um, Isaiah, who was one of the later writing prophets. And he also makes reference to the Spirit in a prophetic utterance. So, um, uh, Kristen, would you read Isaiah? Isaiah 61, 1-2 The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners, to announce a year of favor from the Lord, and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn. Now you're familiar with that passage because in the Gospel according to Luke, when Jesus goes to the uh, synagogue in Nazareth, he's handed the book of the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads that exact passage. And, and then he concludes by saying, after he read it, today this passage is fulfilled in your presence, or in your hearing, uh, claiming that he, it, this is talking about him. So the Holy Spirit it was upon Isaiah in his experience, but the Holy Spirit would be upon Messiah. The word, because the Lord has anointed me. This was seen as an, a messianic promise or prophecy. Now, um, another prophet among the Nebiim uh, is Joel, and it's the coming outpouring of the Spirit upon all humanity. See, in the Old Testament, we get a sense that the Spirit is poured out uh, to certain groups of people, certain individuals, but not to everybody. Remember, he only took 70 elders up on the mountain and they came upon the 70 elders and spilled over into the camp to Eldab and Medab, but it wasn't like all the Israelites received the Spirit. Well, in Joel, he gives this uh, astonishing prophecy that that gift of the Spirit will be poured out upon all of humanity. So I was wondering if you would be willing to read that, Tony. Microphone, please. shall come to pass. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even upon your male and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit. Thank you. So one of the characteristics that we see in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, of the coming of the spirit is the phenomenon of prophecy, dreams, and visions. Okay. Um, now I want to go back to the worksheet. We'll get those other passages in another section. So, um, B, we should be at B. The Spirit's role in the incarnation. 
<clears throat> Are you there with me? Okay. It was through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus conceived in the womb the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is really important. It was through the power of the Holy Spirit that this miracle occurred. Why is this so important? Well, because in the ancient world, um, which in the uh, religions of uh, Greece and Rome and um, throughout the ancient world, um, uh, gods and goddesses were abundant. And there were stories of gods coming down from Mount Olympus and having carnal relations with virgins. You know the stories. Um, uh, Zeus was quite the womanizer, and he ravished many mortal women, and he produced offspring that were half divine or half god and half human, and Hercules is one of those. So this, I I'm saying this to you because this is a very common understanding in the ancient world. They, they knew these stories. So Luke is very careful when he is giving the story of the Annunciation or the Incarnation that it wasn't like that. <laughs> this is different. It wasn't that the Virgin Mary had carnal relations with a, a God who is uh, very much like a human physical being but just happens to be immortal and has superpowers. It wasn't like that at all. This is, we're talking about the, the unknowable God um, um, then sends the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit comes upon the Virgin Mary and through the, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit she conceives miraculously within her womb. And it's why it's always been emphasized by Christians that she's ever virgin. Does, does that make sense? She never had sexual relations. This is to, and the church has always taught this in, uh, uh, as a way of emphasizing that you're not to think of the conception of Jesus in crudely materialistic ways as these other stories talk about. This was a, a, a miracle without any human agency or without any sexual relationship. Okay. So I have a question about that. Um, well, yeah. So what you're saying is that it's a completely, uh, a, there, it's a point of distinction, very important point of distinction. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with, or it could, but I'm not sure, the way that the church held or, you know, the people held sexual relations you know, was it a beautiful thing? Was it a taboo thing? Was it a, you know, because I, that's what I'm interested in, in in this way is like, would it be that horrible for um, her to be impregnated by a sexual act? Yeah. You know, um, only if we thought badly of sex, you know, yeah. so that I'm just, I mean, I'm, I, I do believe in the, the, the spirit. I do believe that whole story. I do. I, I hold yeah. it dearly in my heart. So, but I, I just want it to, I want to just pick it apart so bad and yeah. just clear it up so good so that, you know, if I ever have to tell anybody about it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, this happened, that happened, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that I have a really good story to say, you know, really clear and concise. I really like what you just said. That was very good. Yeah. But I, I you know, I'm, I'm wondering if there's any other influence there. Yeah, well, there, there could very well be. Um, and, uh, I, I think that... Now, I, I'm not an expert in this because I haven't read all the documents of the ancient world on human sexuality, but um, human sexuality is, um, in the ancient world, was both sacred and profane at the same time. And it never fully um, is ab uh, able to... Uh, it, sex human sexuality was... It, it, there's a love-hate relationship to it. And I think that's true universally, even in our own time. Even ourselves, as persons, we kind of have a love-hate relationship with our sexuality. And the reason why uh, the ancients were always suspicious, and particularly Christians later on, of human sexuality or sexuality in general, is because it is a force and power in operation in our lives that we can't fully control. You lose your mind when you're caught up in sexual ecstasy. And for those people, that's a problem. So sexuality wasn't really seen in a real positive way in, in, in that regard. 
And so the ancients always um, looked upon sexuality with a great deal of suspicion. They recognized its power. Now the fertility cults, certain religions were fertility cults, they worshiped sexuality. But they worshiped it not because it was fun or pleasurable. They worshiped it because they saw the power of life in it and that it overcomes. Even a man like Alexander the Great, who can conquer the whole world, um, it, uh, falls prey to his own sexual desires and may have even had something to do with his untimely death. So, okay. Yes, uh, the microphone. The person about to speak here is Mother Esther Diane. Do not forget that. <laughs> In the ancient world, um, procreation was understood uh, in terms of male seed, which was semen, uh, placed in the woman, and she was basically an oven or an incubator. Uh, becoming a child was totally the work of the growth of that seed within the womb of the woman. Uh, a woman was understood to be a deformed male. So in this particular story, it seems to me that the lesson to be taken from it in reference to the Blessed Virgin Mary is that the the child that is growing in her womb is a divine child mm -hmm. and not in any sense a human child at that point because humanity came through the seed of a man and for that reason historically the church ends up saying that Jesus gets his humanity from his mother mm -hmm. and his divinity comes from God through the auspices of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Thank you for that insight. And that's very powerful because um, uh, and, and what an astonishing, startling, and radical thing that's being said here. Because everyone understood that you got your humanity from your father. All, all of you did. That's how the ancient world thought. Um, uh, they didn't have the idea that there was this, you know, you had an egg and a sperm that came together and that you're 50% your mother and father. That idea was unknown. The father's seed is the entire person. And, and that seed then um, uh, impregnates a woman and she becomes the vessel, but she has made no co genetic contribution to the humanity. So when Christian theologians were saying, ancient Christian theologians saying, that Jesus got his entire humanity from his mother, that in itself would have been a miracle in the minds of the ancient world. Does that make sense? Uh, science later we would realize that there, it, it doesn't work that way. This is why the ancient he peoples, particularly the Hebrews, um, were opposed to masturbation for males. They never say anything about female masturbation. <laughs> it's all about male masturbation because the emission of semen is like, those are little human beings you spilled on the ground and they don't belong to you. They belong to the community. What are you doing? You're out of your mind. We can't be wasting that. Do you see? It was like akin to murder. This is also why the ancient Hebrews condemned homosexuality. Be not because there was something wrong with having pleasure with a man. It was because you're wasting seed. You're willfully putting that seed in a vessel that cannot reproduce or cannot uh, uh, provide uh, for the birth of a child. And this is why a woman who was barren, who could not be impregnated, was, that was a curse. And inevitably, a man who has an unfertile wife, he would keep her, but he would have another wife. And that's why polygamy became very common, because it was a matter of, for the sake of the survival of the social group, we have to reproduce. Remember, children died. Nine out of ten children died before they're five. Uh, so 
to have children, to have progeny was not just in the interest of, of you and your family, it was in the interest of the whole social group that you belong to. Quite the opposite of how we've grown up. It's like, please limit it. <laughs> we have this little pill for you. <laughs> okay, all right. <clears throat> Uh, I completely, totally forgot where I was. Oh, the role of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit. So we talked a lot about that. So you got the enunciation from Luke, and you know about the visitation. Um, let's go to see the Spirit and the preaching of John the Baptist. And basically that is this. John said, I baptize you in water, but there is one who comes after me of whom I'm not worthy even to untie his shoe or to unlace his sandal. He it is that will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. So now we get this prophetic image of baptism in the Holy Spirit. So John baptized in water, but the Messiah will baptize in the Holy Spirit. That, that is the word. Are we on page four yet? Okay. Are you having a good time so far? Okay, good, good. So then we have to ask the question, what is John talking about? What is baptism? Are you on page four? The word to baptize, or the noun form baptism, had the following nuances in Greek usage at the time of the gospel writers. Most often used descriptively of an action or an event. So here's what I, I, I want to take a little time. Uh, how did the Greeks use the word? And someone brought me a... a a marker. Did I? Oh, here it is. Thank you. Was it? Was that you, Mariah, who provided me marker? She's a school teacher. She has all the stuff. Okay. The Greek word. This is the Greek word. Um, I'll transliterate it into English. Baptizo. That's, that's, that's an exact translation of that. And in English, we translate it, I baptize. Is that right? With an S? Yes. Okay. So, we think, when we hear the word baptism, almost 99.9% .9 of the time, we think of a religious rite that's done in church, right? We don't use that word outside of the church context, although sometimes lit, uh, in literature or poetry, the word will be used as, to apply to something else, but, it's, but it never loses that religious connotation. In the first century, it had no religious meaning whatsoever. It wasn't a religious word. It was a common functional word that was used all the time. So it's really important for us at this point to do a little bit of an uh, a, a etymological study, that is a study of this word. What it's, how was this word used that was very commonly used in the conversation of the Greeks of the first century? Well, um, uh, I'm not much of an artist but hopefully you'll recognize something here. This is a bucket, or a jar, if you will, that's lowered into a well. And then it's pulled up, and it's filled to the brim to overflowing with the water, right? You've seen that image before. A Greek would say, baptizo. That's the action you perform to do that. So, baptizo, in this sense, means to be filled to capacity and overflowing. Okay? I'll have to get an artist to do this all up for me. Now, there's another way the word was used. Um, and that is... Um, I'm not much of an artist, so you just have to... Okay. What does that look like to you? It's a boat. A boat, okay. The only problem is 
this boat is under the sea. <laughs> Here's my fish, my ichthusis, swimming around. The Greeks were a seafaring people. They sailed all around the Aegean Sea, and they were very much engaged and, uh, and led the ancient world in, um, in an economy of harvesting sponges. And they still do this to this day. Sponges are a very useful thing, used for cleaning and all of that. Uh, they would harvest from the sea. So anyway, ships were a common way of life. Also, uh, it was um, very common that a ship would strike a rock and sink. It sinks down into the water um, so that it's underwater and the water now uh, surrounds the boat and is within the boat. It's totally down under the water. A Greek would say, baptizo. That ship was baptizo. <laughs> so it would be used in reference to um, a ship lost at sea. It sunk. Are you liking that? Okay. Now, also a part of the ancient economy was that of the blacksmith. And the blacksmith works with um, material uh, like iron ore, metal, and they're heating it up really hot in a furnace so it's red hot, and then they'll plunge it into cold water. And they're hammering it and they're doing this repeatedly. Does anyone know why they do that? It makes it stronger. makes the, the bonding of the molecules stronger, and they call it tempering. So that's how they did the metal work. So this action, plunging the sword into the water, Greek would say, baptizo. So the meaning of the word already we've seen, to be filled to overflowing, to be sunk in the sea, so you're surrounded by the water, or to plunge into water like a blacksmith. That was, oh, I, I forgot to show you my drawing of the sword, the handle of the sword, and then the blade. There. Well, not that great. And the <laughs> Okay. Sound by fajitas, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, great. Okay. Now, I've already mentioned to you the sponge. Have you ever used a real sponge, not the ones that we, yeah. you know, does that kind of look like a sponge? SpongeBob. Okay. Okay. So you've done this when you wash your car. You take a sponge. And, and, and you would plunge it into the water, and then you would pull it out, and it's just dripping with water, and if you touch it, it squirts water. This action, baptizo. So that what is happening with the sponge, the sponge is soaking in all of the water that it's being immersed in, and so that there's no place for air. You know, you squeeze it and then you let it out and it sucks in all the water. So it's completely drenched in uh, the medium and the water it was plunged in. So plunge, fill to overflowing, sunk into, and, um, and then uh, uh, drenched to the point where wherever you touch that sponge, water is, come, is oozing out. Baptizo. Are you having a good experience so far? Yep. Okay. Now, did I do them all? Uh, oh no! This is this is this is really good. So you got the uh, you got the idea of drenched. Now, um, it better be good because your sword drawing was the best so far. Okay. <laughs> now this I dedicate to Mariah. Okay. This is a piece of cloth woven together. You see the threads makes the cloth. And it, the Greeks were very famous for dyeing cloth. It was a big industry. In fact, in the book of Acts, Lydia was a dyer of cloth. And you take the cloth, the wool, and you, you, you soak it. 
in the die. No, that's not it. That's, that's death. <laughs> D-Y-E, right? And they were famous for their purple dye. So they would plunge the fabric into the dye and let it soak. That soaking action means that the material that was will take on all of the color characteristics. It was just a, a dirty white looking material. You plunge it into the dye, it comes up and it's a beautiful blue. You soak it for many hours to get that effect, maybe for days. Um, to soak fabric in order to dye it in the dye, a Greek would say, baptizo. So, the word means to dye, to soak, to drench, to fill to overflowing, to plunge. So you can see the word baptizo is a verb that is a descriptive of an action and these various aspects. So now John takes this word that was used in the Greek language, very common word, and he says, I baptize you in water. Why? Because he was putting, putting people under the waters of the Jordan River. But one is coming who's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And it means all of those things. To be baptized in the Holy Spirit is to be filled to overflowing with the Spirit, to be sunk into the great um, endless body of the Holy Spirit, to, to be plunged like a sword, uh, to temper and be made strong in the Holy Spirit, um, to uh, be like a sponge that is drenched with the Holy Spirit, or to be like a fabric in a dye. So it, it, in all those cases, it's about transformation. Transformation. So it gives us a clue that the Holy Spirit is an all-encompassing, I mean the baptism in the Holy Spirit is an all-encompassing experience. In this case, you are the object. The Holy Spirit is the medium, and Jesus is the one who baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. It is Jesus who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. He is the person who does it. He is the one who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Yes. So. What are the words then? What are the words? Okay. Okay, here they are. Number one. Filled and overflowing are the words in number one. Number two, sunk. <laughs> like, you're sunk. Number three, the word is plunged. Number four, I got three words here. Number four, it's immersed. The sponge is immersed. So that every part is soaked or drenched beyond capacity. And five, a f did you get soaked and drenched there for number four? Okay, number five, a fabric of cloth that is soaked in dye so that it takes on the color of the dye. You are to be soaked in the Holy Spirit so you'll take on the color, your life takes on the color of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a beautiful image? I like that better than the ship sunk at the bottom of the sea. <laughs> okay. Now, we, we, we will uh, get through this section D, and it's about the Spirit in Jesus, okay? The Holy Spirit has a role in, in the life of Jesus. Um, number one, Jesus is conceived, right from the creed, conceived by the Holy Spirit, his conception. So the Holy Spirit was present in Jesus' life in a miraculous way from the beginning. At the baptism of the Lord by John the Baptist, the Spirit descends, you have the descending spirit upon Jesus. Number three, are you with me? Yes. Remember the next big event in Jesus' life, his temptation? You know, he was led to that by the Holy Spirit. The Holy, uh, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In Mark's gospel, see, Luke, I think I have it from Luke's here, he's led in the Spirit. He, that's how Luke, it's very polite. You get a sense that the Holy Spirit's just kind of leading Jesus by the hand into the desert. I like Mark's gospel, because Mark's gospel, uh, it, it says, and Jesus was driven, or rather, Jesus was thrown into the wilderness. The image being, if I were to take Meredith, grab her by her britches and her neck, and I just toss her out into the desert. I mean, 
Mark uses a very violent, dramatic word. In other words, Jesus was compelled to go out into the desert. The Spirit compelled him to face the evil one. I didn't know that. Yeah, not interesting. Well, I mean, I know the devil lured him out. I mean, I no. thought the devil. You thought the devil lured him out. Lured no, him out. it was the Spirit. It's like, okay, now you, you had this vision, and you, 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 you know that. Yeah, now you got to. Your, your first assignment is go out to the desert wilderness and take on the devil. <laughs> His first assignment. He overcomes the devil, and the first miracle he performs in the Synoptic Gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that tell this story, the first miracle that Jesus performed is an exorcism. He comes out, and there's a demon-possessed man in the synagogue. No one knew that. All of a sudden, he started manifesting this evil spirit, and Jesus tells him to shut up and get out. And people were amazed. Well, we don't know. In John's Gospel, the first miracle is the wedding at Cana. So we always say the first miracle of Jesus was at the wedding at Cana. But in the Synoptic Gospels, there's no mention of the wedding. They, don't, they just don't talk about it. So the first miracle of Jesus in Mark's Gospel and, and in Luke and Matthew, borrowed it from Mark, is an exorcism. In other words, Jesus' first assignment was to go and uh, um, um, uh, struggle with the devil in the wilderness. He overcomes the devil in the wilderness and he comes back and then he goes to one of the uh, devil's underlings, a demon, and kicks him out. Would okay. have been more public. Very public. Rather than the wedding. Was the wedding was kind of a. Kind of but I love the wedding story. So if you ask me the first miracle Jesus performed, I would always say the, the turning of water into wine, and that's a nice, safe answer. But just so you know, in the Synoptic Gospels, they mention nothing about the wedding. The first miracle is an exorcism. Very dramatic. <laughs> now, the reason it's important, see the connection between the two stories? The Holy Spirit tosses Jesus into the desert. The word is in Greek is ex balo. Ex balo. The Spirit is tossing him out. And when he casts out a demon, which is his first miracle, when he comes back to Galilee after being in the wilderness, that word cast out, ex balo. So the Holy Spirit casts Jesus into the desert Jesus comes back having overcome the prince of demons, the devil, and now he's casting and compelling demons to leave. Isn't that a powerful image? Yeah, and that's the conclusion of tonight's lesson. Two more words. Any, any more? Oh, you want two more words? Okay, conceive, led. Oh, did I say led by the Spirit? Oh, number four. Jesus sees himself as a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy of the anointing of the Spirit. The anointing of the Spirit. And then number five, um, Jesus speaks of the coming of the Holy Spirit upon his disciples. So we have all these different verbs that are used. And, and adverbs to describe the Holy Spirit it's always associated with energy and action and activity and movement which is a really good theological word the Holy Spirit is God's movement towards us okay everybody thanks for your patience and we're gonna get through this material someday Steve will actually be truly confirmed <laughs>